Well, talk of a comprehensive strategy has uh, set me up very well, so thank you. Uh, and no, no general, and there's quite a few out there, uh, can talk without quoting from Clausewitz or Sun Tzu, <coughs> and I'm no different. It was Sun Tzu who said in 500 BC that strategy without tactics is the slowest route to victory. Tactics without strategy is merely the noise before defeat. If I have a single theme over the next few minutes, it's that we've consistently fallen into Sun Tzu's trap. Lots of policy, masquerading as strategy, and certainly lots of tactics. But few joined up long-term plans that successfully synthesize strategic ends, ways, and means, the essence of a strategy. Amongst other things, this has led to many false lessons about the nature of war, including that more conventional operational concepts, albeit updated to reflect the arrival of modern technology, are outmoded and unlikely to lead to strategic success. Well, I question this assumption. I'd also ask that you distinguish between conventional military operations, at their most impressive on the Blitzkrieg model, and enduring stabilization operations, including counterinsurgency. Joining the nexus between the two has been our problem, leading both to be tarnished. I should emphasize that I take as a given that no military operation should be launched unless it's well-rooted in a political framework. Every officer is taught this uh, from day one of attendance at Staff College if only others uh, understood this as well. So a few thoughts, some of which I think are pretty timeless. If states want to achieve strategic success, let alone a desired tactical outcome, those states have to be genuinely and full-bloodedly committed to their cause. The concept of discretionary war has no meaning to those fighting them at the low tactical level or, importantly, to the millions of innocent people whose lives will be ruined by a failure to fight wars properly. From a humanitarian perspective, often the proclaimed basis for going to war in the first place, if that is the approach, then better let your more single-minded enemy win. In the British Armed Forces, we talk colloquially of clout, don't dribble. It's a simple adage that rarely fails those who apply it, and I just hope the translator gets it right. Turning to some specifics from the last few years, Afghanistan is often unjustifiably and certainly prematurely described as something of a failure. In fact, in the context of this session, certainly, the first phase of the Afghan war, if you cast your minds back to it, was a stunning success a model proxy operation. Local indigenous forces, supported by specialist capabilities from key allies, especially air and special forces, won that stunning victory, which was followed up, actually, by a rapidly deployed stabilization force. It was only then that a combination of naivety and a distracting focus on Iraq allowed the states concerned not to follow up their military success with the Marshall Plan scale of generosity and decisive early commitment in the non-military sphere that was required for enduring strategic success. It wasn't until about 2010 that the right formula was sort of reached, but by then the challenges were much greater. As an aside, incidentally, it's vital that we continue to support Afghanistan now in order to not, not to repeat there the errors of premature withdrawal being played out in Iraq today. Turning to Iraq, the operation of 2003 was arguably even more stunning a tactical campaign than that that happened in Afghanistan two years earlier. But once again, it was marred at the strategic level by a failure to think through and apply some timeless lessons. Lessons that we should not forget, but were applied almost to perfection only 50 years or so earlier, at the end of World War II, when a combination of generosity of spirit and pragmatic accommodation, a proper understanding of the strategic purpose, and a focus on economic recovery and popular support 
through the gift of the Marshall Plan, was synthesized almost to perfection. Marshall, by the way, and most of you will know this, was a soldier. Experience in Afghanistan and Iraq has, as a result of a failure to learn the right lessons, made Western political leaders in particular very reluctant to risk similar outcomes in fresh campaigns. It's persuaded some to come up with solutions that fall short of the resolute, decisive and long-term commitment that is a timeless lesson of war. In particular, it involves a preference for local or regional forces to act as willing proxies for their own. Now, if Afghan-style proxy indigenous forces, a concept rediscovered tactically in Libya in 2011, are to be used, they require generous and concerted levels of support. Timid support will lead to a worse outcome, one that risks marginalising the good and well-intentioned and encouraging the extremists. It is this, a failure to synthesise ways and means in a timely manner, that some would argue is playing out in Syria and in Iraq. And we must be careful not to add further confusion through the loose use of terminology. Daesh, for example, may use terrorist techniques, but they possess all the trappings of a conventional army. They hold ground, they manoeuvre, they have tanks, artillery, identifiable command and control, and logistic lines of supply. Their defeat requires a combination of largely conventional tactical solutions nested in a strategic campaign that includes a lot of politics. Drones and special forces will not achieve the required outcome. Recalling the hundreds of thousands of people's, who's, uh, people whose lives are already ruined and the many more whose lives yet, may yet be ruined by a failure to resolve the Syrian and a now Iraq crisis in a timely manner, nor will air power alone be sufficient to drive back and then defeat Daesh. It can help prevent their future expansion and certainly has done, but to push back and defeat them will require ground forces that can manoeuvre decisively. But how long do we have? Solutions that talk about a generational timeline risk ceding the strategic initiative to one's enemy and would receive few marks in any staff college. Mass still matters in war, both in conventional operations and in any stabilization phase that follows. If indigenous forces are the solution, their success will require a massive training and support operation, not a few hundred trainers here and there. While the nature of war is timeless, the techniques required to fight one keep evolving. Even 10 years ago, only a few military groupies were really talking about hybrid war, more narrowly defined than it is today, cyber war, and more widely of strategic campaigns fought through the ether and social media in particular, designed to disrupt and defeat opponents, states usually from within. These are very demanding concepts, and the solutions take much intelligent thought, understanding, and generous resourcing. Thus far, states have proved themselves poor at this compared to smaller, agile, and tightly run non-state opponents. This is an area in which we've got to get much better, along with command and control, of, of which more finally in a moment, logistics, air, aviation, and other demanding specialist capabilities that advanced military nations within any coalition should be able to shoulder on behalf of their less technically advanced allies. Intelligent burden sharing in any coalition remains key, and in the context of what we're doing in this region, there's a long way to go, in my judgment. Unity of purpose and unity of command are prerequisites for any successful military operation. Discretionary wars too often lead to confused aims and incoherent command arrangements, the antithesis of what is needed. Here, the GCC, as many in the organization I know aspire to, would set a fine example by creating for themselves a militarily efficient joint command so that they're properly able to face up to future challenges together, let alone current ones. NATO in the Cold War would serve as a good basis for the evolution of such arrangements. 
my own experience of command in coalition operations led me to amend Bradley's observation at the end of World War II, in which he famously said that amateurs talk tactics, professionals talk logistics. I've been saying for a number of years that true professionals, first and foremost, talk command and control, then logistics, and then tactics. Without effective command and control, it doesn't actually matter how good one's equipment is, and there's some fantastic equipment in this region, or how well-trained your people are and your units are, your forces will not be effective when put under pressure, which you should expect them to be. Arguably, this is what caused the Iraqi army's problems last summer. It is poorly understood by too many people, especially political leaders, who are not prepared to make the political compromises needed to ensure effective military operations. So finally, in summary, and returning to Sun Tzu, I see a lot of tactics and too little reliable strategy. A strategy that fails to synthesize ends, ways, and means within a strategically sound period of time is no strategy, but ultimately could be dangerous self-deception that could result in many more people's lives being ruined and vital strategic goals being missed. Thank you. Thank you very much. David, thank you for that brilliant exposition of strategy. Jamal Khashoggi. I'm so tempted to use this line, even though I'm, I'm sure somebody have used it before me. 10 years ago, when the Manama Dialogue started, it started with double I, double S, and now it is ISIS all over. Uh, and it is not wrong to say that, because ISIS deserves that, particularly for us, the Arabs. The danger of ISIS is real, and we need to spend much time uh, understanding ISIS and understanding its root causes. Because if we do not do that, 10 years later, many of us will be living in an ISIS country, in an ISIS territory somehow or another. Because ISIS is not an army, as Mr. Fajal ex explained a while ago. It's an idea that feeds in our failures. The Iraqi finance minister, Mr. Hushyar Zipari said that yesterday in the conference, uh, that he, he said, we were afraid of a failed state. Now I'm afraid of a failed region. We see the failed region in many parts of the Arab world today. Why we fail to see that tree of ISIS growing around us for the last 10 years? Because there are ISIS elements in all of us in the Arab world. In most Arab states, with the absence of the following rule of law, democracy, human, right, value, uh, human rights values, and interest uh, in a better life for all, the absence of all of that is similar to what ISIS stands for. So we share those elements with ISIS, so ISIS is not, should not be a surprise to us. We share some of ISIS uh, uh, ideas. Up to 2011, we, we, we only were concerned with the security matters around the issue of Iran, Iraq, and whatever branch from, from both, like the nuclear issue, Iran's intervention in the region, uh, war in Iraq, Al-Qaeda there, Iraq after American withdrawal. All those issues were discussed repeatedly in the various rounds of double I, double S uh, meetings here in Manama. Somehow with our failures in most of the previous issues, the tree of ISIS was growing in Iraq and later in Syria and in other parts of the Arab world and it, and it continued to branch out. Yes, it is a radical form of Islam. We all agree on that. Some of us, many, uh, say it's not Islam. No, it is, it is a radical form of Islam. But every society has a radical movement or had a radical nuclear ideas, whether it is around religion or around race. But those movements, they always stay small. 
uh, insignificant uh, under the the limitations and the rule of the governing law in those countries. Sometimes they make it and they go even to the parliament, but they stay unattractive. But why our radical thought or, or, or our radical movement grow out of control? That is something for us to discuss. I'm sure the ideas of Salafi jihadists, the narrow understanding of Islam, going to continue with us. Going, many of us are going to carry on those ideas with them. But why should those ideas be attractive, be an alternative to our, uh, to our future? That's what we did not discuss in ISIS, uh, in, 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 in double I, double is conference in the last 10 years. The Arab world was and is still decaying. Bad governance, failed educations, unfair distribution of wealth, social injustice, which lead for our land to be a fertile land for radical ideas. In early 2011, history finally smiled upon the Arab states. When the wave of democracy that hit Greece, Spain, Portugal in 1970s, Eastern Europe in the, in, in, in the late 80s, and Latin America, when, when that wave of democracy reached us, Arab youth raising their non-radical voices. There were no flag of ISIS, no flag of, Al of Al Qaeda in Tahrir Square of Egypt or elsewhere. They were calling for freedom, for justice, equality, and happy life. Some countries in the Arab world, they were smart enough to accommodate those voices, like this, this country, Bahrain, Jordan, Oman, and they succeeded, and, and, and Morocco in particular. They succeeded in, in, in withstanding the, the, the waves. However, others resisted this wave. And, but with their resistance, they failed to sustain the old system that delusionally they thought it was a stability. It wasn't a stability. I like a term of a friend who, who called it the st stability of the graves, the stability of fear. They failed to, to maintain that old system, but in the same time, did not allow a new Arab order based in the true democratic values to prevail, which resulted in a civil war and chaos. Because the choice was either to let a new system uh, emerge, but since we did not allow it to emerge, chaos as we see today in Syria or in Libya and in, 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 in Iraq too. This chaos is another branch of ISIS tree, which depends which deepened and reached its peak last summer when it took over the second largest city in Iraq, Mosul. Taking over Mosul is not the most painful thing. It is a serious defeat for an Arab idea, but it's not the most painful thing. The most painful thing that the people of Mosul accepted ISIS. That is, uh, that is some, uh, 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 a fact that needs studying, needs looking at, that people chose ISIS as their future rather than the dreams they had for modernity uh, in, 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 in previous time. Uh, and, and I'm sure if the people of Mosul today were given the choice to return to the control of the government of Baghdad or stay under ISIS, maybe they will choose ISIS. That is something we need to discuss. When, 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 this, when a rotten uh, radical ideas like ISIS become attractive to the future of the Arab world. Thank you very much. Jamal, thank you very much. Uh, also, uh, a fourth in a row brilliant presentation that has brought a lot of uh, uh, important issues to, to, to the table. Mark, uh, remind us of 164 centrifuges in 2004 and many thousands uh, now. Uh, Basma Kudmani uh, did tell us that if um, uh, moderate forces in Syria are assured that there is an end game uh, for Syria, they might be willing for a time to serve as the ground forces for the coalition's air forces. But that promise has to be real and credible. Uh, David Richards, in his 
um, uh, strategic statement uh, also reminded us that while uh, Daesh uses terrorist methods, they have conventional cap capabilities and raised the question whether, as it were, asymmetric tactics against Daesh are, are proper and that maybe we should have a, a symmetric campaign against Daesh and uh, deal with uh, a power that has conventional forces with uh, conventional uh, riposte. And the same issue of governance that Basma Kodmani raised was also powerfully raised uh, by uh, Jamal Khashoggi. We have a number of people on the list. I'm going to take six or seven. Um, uh, I'm interested as much in, uh, in, in crisp questions as in uh, crisp uh, comments. Um, and um, uh, so invite you uh, to uh, see what, uh, say what sees you here. Dr. Cl Florence Gaub first, please. Um, when I, when I contemplated the, the topic of the session, Reflections on 10 Years of Change, first I think about what has not changed in the last 10 years, and that's protracted instability. When uh, I started working on this region, there's been interstate war, intrastate war, conflict instability has been endemic all along. And as a political scientist or international relations theorist, we believe that the region um, is the victim of its latecomer status in the international system, which makes it vulnerable to foreign interference, but also uh, due to the fact that it has so many middle powers which create a balance of weakness rather than a balance of power, meaning that states can actually um, interfere with each other rather than create stability, a hegemon that could create stability. But what is new and what has changed is that 2011 began as a domestic challenge, but it's become a regional problem. What's new is the Gulf moment. And um, Gulf states have, in a way, created a villa in the jungle, uh, an island of stability, um, which maybe allows them, and that would be my question, to seize the situation. And so my question to the panel would be, how can the Gulf states seize the moment to be a stability producer rather than a security consumer as it's been in the past and drive the region, fortunately or hopefully, to a more stable next decade. Thank you. Florence, thank you very much. I think a lot of people took down your villa in the jungle uh, uh, <laughs> phrase. Um, uh, Dr. Albad al uh, Thank you very much, John. Uh, I just want to... Uh, um, I'm a little bit concerned uh, about playing fast and loose with historical facts. Um, in the case of the rise of uh, ethnic exclusivist uh, movement to power, I mean, obviously the European uh, experience with the Nazis and the fascists, or whether the Afrikaner regime, the exclusionist, uh, racialist regime in South Africa, or the segregationist in southern United States, uh, and this also will include the Jewish exclusive state of Israel supported, cuddled, and encouraged and abetted by Western powers. So it's not just, uh, uh, ISL is not an Arab and Muslim phenomena exclusively. Uh, we have plenty of Western history where those movements rose to power. We're not minority, rose to power and dominated. So just uh, to clear the, to make the historical facts straight, but my question is not about this, about is to uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Kudmani regarding uh, good governance. <coughs> now, obviously, our experience with the Arab Spring, um, uh, to put it generously, uh, uh, was not, was not uh, good. Uh, the outcome we were hoping for of equality, democracy, and uh, what have you uh, uh, was not attained. So my, my question is, could it be a regionally conceived uh, or a regional concept, a local concept of good governance that is based on Islamic Arab conception of rule of law, ambassman, uh, equality before the law, accountability, could be an alternative to liberal Western style, Westminster style government? Thank you. Thank you very much. A very important question. Dr. Ayman Safadi, former Deputy Prime Minister of Jordan. Thank you, John. I think a lot of us, when they look at the outcome of the last 10 years, you know, some of us seem, seem surprised, uh, which we should not. I think 
last ten years have been a failure, but ultimately I think what we've seen in the last few years is the harvest of a century of failure in the Arab world to establish functioning uh, nation states for all the reasons that Jamal al Hashikji sort of mentioned, which I totally agree with, uh, and, and other reasons. Question is, looking forward, are we in any position to fix what has happened? And judging but by what we're seeing, I think the answer is no. I think if we think we are in a bad situation now, I think things are going to get much, much worse. Uh, why I say that? Because despite all the rhetoric, we're not really seeing any strategic, long-term sort of action to address the root cause of the problems and, and set the region on a path towards a solution. Look at uh, Syria, for instance. Uh, the war on ISIS now, we're talking about 60 nations as being part of the coalition. In reality, uh, this is not the case. Uh, we're fighting ISIS uh, in Iraq. Uh, for reasons that have to do with a Western understanding of what the nature of the problem is, but we're not addressing the key issue, which is Syria. The fact is, even if you destroy ISIS in Iraq, it's going to go back to Syria, penetrate into the chaos that Syria has become, regroup, feed on the dis despair, feed on the frustration, and then spread into the rest of the region. And if we look at you know, the voice of, of, of Ms. Qadamani, for instance, among the early voices of the Syrian revolutions, where are they now? They're nowhere to be heard. Uh, none of the representatives of the country that are that are uh, that have spoken in the last two days, for instance, here have indicated any long-term plan that could offer the promise of a solution. Uh, it's become for a lot of those countries, it's a luxury. Uh, part of it is because the strategy has been designed, uh, conceptualized in the West, with very little regards to the, to, to the understanding of the problem of the region, uh, partly because of the complacency of the Arab world as well. We've seen the problem emerging for years. Uh, we've seen Syria uh, deteriorate from a, a revolution for democracy and freedom from an oppressive regime into a sectarian war, a civil war, a battlefield for a regional war, and, and very little uh, is being done about it. So I think, to sum up, I think the 10 years coming are going to be much, much worse because we're dealing with the symptoms of the problem. We're not looking at the root cause of the problem. We're not addressing the main issue of why terrorism is spreading now, which is Syria, because it's not convenient for the countries that are, that are in charge now uh, uh, to do so. And I'll just throw one example, and probably Ms. Qadamani could address that, is that what are we doing about Syrian refugees now? All the talk now is about probably providing daily subsistence, food, water. But in reality, in Jordan, for instance, there are about 1.4 million people, of whom 600,000 are registered as refugees. Among these, at least, there are 100 children below the age of 10. What are those going to be 10 years from now if they are not provided with schools, with education, with hope? We're looking at a ready army for what is worse than ISIS to come and, 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 and recruit. Thank you. Iman, thank you very much. Uh, I might call now on, on Toby Dodge and whatever he had planned to say, if we might also react to Jamal Khashoggi's rather st strong statement that the tragedy in Mosul was not just that ISIL got to Mosul, but that the population of Mosul largely accepted it. Toby. Yes, uh, thank you. The, the population of Mosul is about 1.8 million. And I think uh, to say that even a, a small minority of that population accepted uh, uh, Daesh's seizure of the city, I'd need to see a lot more information because that's counter to my analysis and nearly all the analysis and the, the, the reports from the city that I've seen. I think it would be much uh, more sustainable to argue that the generalized revolt that we saw spread across the northwest of Iraq from um, probably the removal of Isala, Isi, uh, al Asawi, the, the finance minister in 2012, through 2013 and 14, uh, it, it gave, uh, created the arena within which five or six insurgent groups, one of which was the Islamic State, managed to seize large amounts of territory. I think that would be a more sustainable uh, point. Um, my question was actually to Lord Richards. Um, uh, and if I may uh, do the damage of paraphrasing your excellent talk, it was uh, the military had stunning successes, but they were la la let down by the lack of a political strategy. So if the, if the men and women in uniform are so good, how do we get uh, better politicians to give them political strategies? Um, and the, uh, I, I, I'd appreciate a detailed uh, answer to that. Um, and secondly, how do we impose a political strategy or how do we work through a political strategy when you're deploying proxy forces? That seems to me 
uh, and uh, as evidenced by Afghanistan, to be a contradiction in terms. Thanks very much. We'll come back to that. Matthew Harris. Thank you. Um, I'd like to invite um, Lord Richards to reflect on what we heard um, yesterday, which was a major new agreement between the UK and Bahrain. Uh, a foreign secretary talking about the UK being back in business uh, east of Suez. Uh, the defense secretary hammering home uh, the British will to fight. So the UK's military ambitions, um, especially in the Middle East, uh, are not shrinking. Um, but resources have shrunk, um, and they may well shrink more. Uh, if not in real terms, then at least in, in terms of percentage of GDP. Um, so my question is, is the UK going to be spending enough on defence to match its ambitions? If not, which is it that needs to change? Is it the spending uh, or the ambitions? And you told us Sun Tzu's thoughts on um, strategy without tactics. What about strategy without money? <laughs> Michael Brown. John, thanks very much. Uh, when I look at the regional security changes that have taken place over the past 10 years, there's been a lot of focus on problems. I'd like to highlight one contribution to solutions, and that is this Manama dialogue. And since it would be immodest for you to brag about it, let me take my two minutes and do that for you. Uh, this is not just a superb conference. I really see this as the Institute using its convening power to engage in a very important network building, relationship building, and capacity building exercise in a cumulative 